All right, the next section in chapter 22 is all about conjugate addition reactions. And let's just really quickly redefine what conjugation is. If you remember, we covered it previously where we said conjugated systems are where you have alternating double single bonds. And these are very reactive and they're very, very different than a non-conjugation or non-conjugated system where you have an sp3 carbon spacer, right? So this one's conjugated. This one's non-conjugated. I know this feels like an eternity ago, but we covered reactions with acids under high and low temperature, and we could predict 1,4 versus 1,2 addition. That's actually coming back again in this chapter, but with uh, conjugated systems involving carbonyls. So let's compare what a conjugated system looks like when we have carbonyls. So just like the top one, we have to have alternating double single bonds. However, one of the double bonds is now in a carbonyl system. So it could be a double bond to an oxygen and an aldehyde or a ketone or an ester, something like that. This is still conjugated. And then in the next one, we can compare this to a non-conjugated system, where again, we have some sort of CH, or sorry, sp3 spacer. So this one would be formally classified as non-conjugated. Does that make sense? All right, so this one on the left-hand side is gonna be very reactive. And this, if you remember, is an alpha, beta, unsaturated ketone. And we know this because the alpha position is one carbon away from the carbonyl, and the beta position is right here. Does that make sense? All right, the other thing we really need to consider anytime we have a conjugation or a conjugated system is resonance, right? So let's do a little bit of resonance practice. So for example, let's use that same starting material and I want you to draw all of the possible resonance structures for this starting material. So I'll give you a minute to work on that and see how many you can come up with. But remember, you want to avoid resonance structures with both carbon positive and carbon negative. All right, let's do this as a class. So the first easy one is let's just pull this pi bond up to the oxygen. Now this oxygen has a negative charge and the carbon below it has a positive charge. Makes sense to me. And then for our next one, pull this pi bond over. Now we have a pi bond here, positive charge out on the tail, and the oxygen still has a negative charge. These are really the only two additional resonance structures for this specific conjugated ketone. Does that make sense? Just like with other conjugated systems too, it's a good idea to number atoms. So what we do is we number going one, two, three, four. So you start at the oxygen. And we can do the same thing here. And just be thorough, I'll go through and do the whole thing here. All right, so imagine that you're a nucleophile. You've got a choice now of two different sites to attack. We have two different electrophilic positions. We've got an electrophile here which we've seen nucleophiles attack this carbon right a bit. But carbon-4 is also electrophilic in this um, situation, so we do need to account for that. So now the question is, if you're a nucleophile, which position is more likely to be attacked, carbon-2 or carbon-4? And the short answer is, it depends. <laughs> so let's make a list. So strong or unstable nucleophiles. favor a 
attack at carbon two. So what were some examples we've seen where we had nucleophiles attacking a carbonyl carbon? Does anybody remember? Hydroxide, so alkoxides. Both of these are pretty good nucleophiles, not super stable. What else? It's a big one. Grignard reagents, right? Those are pretty common. We also just saw during our ACS review that uh, lithiates behave a lot like Grignard reagents. So all of these are very strong nucleophiles. They tend to really want to attack at a carbonyl carbon. Does that make sense? Flip side is stable nucleophiles. favor carbon-4. And what I mean by this is quite often they are resonance stabilized. So we're going to cover what that means later, but this is the big takeaway, is that strong nucleophiles favor attack at carbon-2, stabilized nucleophiles favor attack at carbon-4. All right, so now let's do an example of this. And let's first prepare uh, our alpha, beta, unsaturated ketone. And you may remember we've actually done this already. One of the easiest ways to do this is from an aldol reaction, where we said with NaOH, you can form your beta hydroxy aldehyde, right? I should say aldehyde up here too. And then the question is, what do we need to do convert this to an alpha beta unsaturated aldehyde. Does anybody remember? Heat, exactly. So for this last step, what we really need to do is apply heat to this. Heat is the trick that we need in order to get this unsaturation to occur. All right, once we have that ready to go, then we can say, all right, what happens if we treat this with something like Methyl lithium followed by water. What product will you get out? And let's put that product in this box. And then conversely, I'm going to pick a weaker carbon nucleophile. And if you remember, one of the tricks we used was this Gilman reagent. You remember that from the carboxylic acid derivatives chapter? We said we use it because it's bulkier, it's not as nucleophilic. And then we're going to treat this with acid as well. And let's try to predict both of the products that we would get out from this reaction. Who feels confident in their answer? A few people? All right, so let's check. The methyl lithium we know is a strong nucleophile. So for example, we could say this is going to attack in here, kick up electrons, and then in step two, we're going to protonate it. So we should have a methyl group coming off of carbon two. Oops. So let me just add that in. We're going to have an OH here. The hydrogen from the aldehyde is still going to be hanging out. And so this would be referred to as our one, two addition product. Makes sense? All right. For the second one, though, we know it's not going to favor attack there. Instead, let's try to figure out the mechanism using a generic nucleophile. So let's use that same starting material. And 
we know that there's a resonance structure. So I'm going to show the resonance structure where that positive charge is on carbon-4. So these were our two starting structures. And then next, we've got some sort of nucleophile, and I'm just going to make this a generic nucleophile. We know with the Gilman reagent it's going to be a methyl group. But in this situation, it's going to attack carbon-4. All right, and what is this functional group called? It's not an enol because it's not a true alcohol. This will be our enolate. So it's still stuck at the enolate right now. However, in the next step, what we're going to do is treat this with acid. So this pi bond can come down. This carbon can steal its proton back. And we can revert this back to the aldehyde form with our nucleophile right there. Does that make sense? So this mechanism is different than 1,2 addition, which is what we're really used to, but the main attribute of it is that resonance structure. You can show that resonance structure and have your nucleophile attack into that carbon, and then go from your enolate back to your ketone or aldehyde. So let's go and fill in that box. Yeah? So we still receive sub-1,2 addition? Oftentimes you will. It really depends on the nucleophile. Yeah, that's a good question. So for example, up here, the main product we would get out from this reaction would look more like this with the methyl group coming off that 4 position. Does that make sense? All right, so now what we need to do is talk more about these special weak stabilized nucleophiles. There's a whole class of them that are really important in organic chemistry. And they're all directly related to a reaction called the Michael addition reaction. Do you feel special? A little bit? That's good. <laughs> all right, so it's conjugate addition. That's 1,4 addition. Using a resonance stabilized carbanion as a nucleophile. That's the most generic term for a Michael addition reaction. There's a whole bunch of resonance stabilized nucleophiles that you can use, but they all kind of follow the same trends. So let's take a look at this, and I'll show you an example of how this works. That means it's a carbon with a negative charge. Yep. So let's say we start out with this 1,3 dione. We know that these protons in between the two carbonyls are going to be really, really acidic, right? Way more acidic than normal alpha protons because if you pluck them off, they're resonance stabilized between two different carbonyl groups. So let's show that intermediate. And as you can tell, this is resonance stabilized. Therefore, it's a weak nucleophile. This is commonly referred to as a Michael donor. because it's the thing giving electrons to something else, right? All right, so the Michael donor really wants to do 1,4 addition chemistry. So let's take a look at just a generic alpha, beta, unsaturated ketone in this case. And just like I said, we know we can number these going one, two, three, four. So it's gonna favor attack at carbon four. If you want, you can draw the resonance structure. Otherwise, you can just show direct attack at carbon four. So I'll just shortcut this, not draw the resonance structure. We'll attack there. 
kick electrons down, kick electrons up to oxygen, which is in position one. So now we've got this enolate, but we saw previously with 1,4 addition that if you have acid around, so I'll just use generic hydronium in this case, that this can clamp back down and this carbon can steal a proton back from your acid and you can regenerate your ketone. and you get this final product right here. Does that make sense? So that resonance stabilized nucleophile is called a Michael donor. That means the thing that you're attacking is accepting electrons, so it's commonly referred to as your Michael acceptor. Does that make sense? So these reactions look very complicated. The key is trusting your arrow pushing, making sure you're not going too fast and that you're doing that final proton transfer at the very end. So let's take a look at some really common Michael donors that you'll run into. Okay. And all of these are resonance stabilized. So the first one's pretty similar. It's that 1,3 dicarbonyl with a carbanion in between. The next one is the ester variant, Oops. where you have an ester on each side. Doesn't matter really which ester. Usually it's a methyl or an ethyl ester just because these are cheap. And then the nice thing with these is you can do decarboxylation chemistry, which we previously saw, and convert it to a carboxylic acid and blow off CO2. So that works out. You can also have one where it's half ester, half ketone. Same thing, you can do decarboxylation with that. You can also have ones with other electron withdrawing groups. So this one's got a cyano group or a nitrile on it. This one also has resonance, so this one's a good one. Another one that's a little bit less normal is this carbon right here. That carb anion is only resonance stabilized going in one direction, but nitro groups are such strong electron withdrawing groups that they're able to stabilize them just on their own. So you don't need two of them to stabilize that negative charge. And then the other one that we saw that doesn't quite include resonance was the Gilman reagent. And so this one's not your classic Michael donor because it's not resonance stabilized. It's just a weak nucleophile because it's so bulky. So all of these are pretty common. You may see other ones floating around, but the general trend is they're stabilized by resonance or they're super duper bulky where they just can't fit into the one-two position. So which one the most reactive? They're all pretty reactive um, towards conjugate addition. Um, the main thing is you have to have a Michael acceptor that's alpha beta unsaturated. Yeah. So let's do some practice now. I'm going to show you a problem to predict products if there's more than one. And if there's more than one, label them as major and minor. So we'll take cyclohexanone. Step one, I'm going to treat it with LDA. That's our strong base. Step two, I'm going to treat it with an alpha-beta unsaturated aldehyde, which is this. And then in step three, 
I'm going to treat it with my acid. So now the question is what product or products will you get out of this? And if you get more than one product, which one's major and which one's minor? So let's break this down into baby steps. So when we treat this with LDA, it's going to grab one of those alpha protons, right? So let's take a look at the enolate that's formed. We know it's a strong base, so we're only going to get enolate out, not any enol. So that would be our enolate. What I like to do is take a look at my enolate and then ask myself, is this going to favor 1,2 or 1,4 addition? What do you think? One, two, why? Yeah, it's not very stable. It's only resonance stabilized in one direction. So this is relatively unstable. And we'll favor one, two addition. Okay, so let's draw that as our major product and if we do 1, 2 addition, essentially the starting material is going to stay the same. We're going to form a new bond out here. We're going to have an oxygen with a hydrogen on it after it's protonated. You're going to have the hydrogen from the aldehyde as well. And then you're going to have that kicking off of it. So we know that this would be our major product. And that's our 1,2 addition product. However, we might still observe a little bit of 1,4 addition. It's not a very clean reaction. So let's draw that 1,4 addition product. And just like before, it's going to attack the end of that aldehyde and do the conjugate addition. So this would be minor. So most chemists are never satisfied being told they can't do something well. So chemists worked really hard to find a workaround to get this to exclusively do 1,4 instead of 1,2 and try to increase their yields. So I'll show you the workaround that they developed. It's pretty clever. I'm going to scroll up. This is called the stork enamine synthesis. I call it the stork enamine workaround. And as you can probably tell by the name, it involves an enamine. <laughs> so with the stork enamine workaround, you still take the ketone that you wanted to originally do the 1,4 addition, and you convert it to an enamine. And if you want an enamine, should we use a primary or a secondary amine? So secondary amine. So if you use a primary amine, you get an imine. We want an enamine, so it's got to be a secondary amine. We typically want this run in a pH of about 4 to 5, so I'll just show acid in brackets. And we want to remove water during this reaction mixture to drive it out of equilibrium. And if you remember back a few chapters, we saw enamines that look like this. And that's our desired product. What makes this neat, though, is it has a resonance structure where you can push electrons over to the alpha position. And this is a weak nucleophile, let's say weak NU. It's not nearly as reactive as a normal enolate. Does that make sense? So now that we have this, we can then add in our Michael acceptor. So I'm just going to use that same Michael acceptor that we saw before. This carbon can attack the 4 position. 
kick electrons over and up to oxygen. Now we have this oxygen with the negative charge. We still have our aldehyde hydrogen on there. And this is our main intermediate. In the last step of this workaround, you treat this with acid. And if you remember back to our aldehyde and ketone chapter, what happens if you treat an amine with aqueous acid, or an enamine for that matter? What will it convert back into? So we're flooding it with water. That's my hint. Not an alcohol. Ketone, right? If you remember, in this top reaction, we removed water to drive it to the enamine. Now we're adding water back in to push it in the opposite direction. So the enamine, or imine, will revert back to the ketone. And then the other portion that's interesting is over here we've got this enolate. Enolate, when you add acids back into it, will also go back to the aldehyde or ketone that they originated from. So your final product for this reaction is going to look like this. Does that make sense? So this gives you the 1,4 addition product and much, much higher yields than if you were just to treat your starting material with LDA and add it in directly. So this gives 1,4 addition as major product. Does that make sense? All right, that's where we're going to end today. The um, problem of the day is actually a problem that's not in our textbook, but I tried to walk you through step by step. So really read those instructions carefully um, and see if you can figure out how a, Mac, a manic reaction works.